Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to do a little bit of reading today, and we're going to start off with reading, and we're going to go to Numbers. Again, Numbers is a book I would like you all to read. It is packed full of a lot of information. God bless you. It's packed full of a lot of information, and there's several ways you can look at this. It's historical. There's a lesson for us. One more, and you're leaving. I'm just kidding. Let's go, oh, can you get the, um, can you get the um, spots, please? And we're reading out of uh, NLT again. God bless you. And, And I'm sure a lot of you have read this story or at least heard this story, but we're going to kind of study just a little bit. So, the Lord gave Balaam a message for King Balak. Then he said, go back to Balak and give him my message. So Balaam returned and found the king standing beside his burnt offerings, with all the officials of Moab. This was the message Balaam delivered. Balak summoned me to come from Aram. The king of Moab brought me from the eastern hills. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come and announce Israel's doom. But how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I condemn those whom the Lord has not condemned? I see them from the clifftops. I watch them from the hills. I see a people who live by themselves, set apart from other nations, who can count Jacob's descendants as numerous as dust. Sorry, who can count Jacob's descendants as numerous as dust? Who can count even a fourth of Israel's people? Let me die like the righteous. Let my life end like their like theirs. Then King Balak demanded of Balaam, What have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies. Instead, you have blessed them. But Balaam replied, I will speak only the message that the Lord puts in my mouth. 
But Balaam replied, I will speak only the message that the Lord puts in my mouth. Did we read that twice? That's the end of it. Okay. Oh. So Balaam was the guy that was riding on the donkey. And the donkey ended up talking to Balaam later after having saved his life three times. And so again, it's a cool story to go read. But what we are going to kind of look at is ourselves. And I have a question. So as we're thinking about this, you have Balak who understands that Balaam talks to God. You have Balak who understands that there is God. So he believes in God. He trusts God's word. And he's trying to change God's will. And he does all kinds of stuff if you go and you read it. Um, I wanted to read it, but it, the whole story is three chapters. And so I know you guys can't handle that. So you have to go read it on your own. So this specific part, you have somebody who knows God, has a relationship with God, understands of God's understands God's mighty power, but is asking for a curse on a people that God has already blessed. So my question to you is who is your enemy? And what did that enemy do against you? Why do you hate them? See, we create a separation from people all the time. All the time. We don't like this school, or we don't like that school. We don't like this little league or that little league. The people from Orland are cheaters and whatever it is. Why? Why do we say these things? Why do we create the separation? Because of one person's behavior. So you do one thing, one bad thing, And we associate you with that one place, the whole place is bad. The water is tainted, the well is tainted, everything is bad. But it closes a door. We create a separation and we decide they are not good but why because we say we are not judgmental right we are not judgmental people we are so accepting of God's love we spread God's love until They do something that we don't agree with. And we judge them against social norms. Well, social norms change. And we need to be careful because we might be cursing a blessed people. Every time we read the Bible, every time we read a story, every time we watch a movie... We instinctively correlate ourselves with the good guy. Well, sometimes we behave like the bad guy. What if you're out there cursing somebody, but it's somebody that God has already blessed and heard their prayers 
and is actively blessing them. In the Bible, here, in this story specifically, what was the concern? They are crossing my borders. They are coming over the borders into my territory, so I hate them. And without missing a beat, you all thought about me talking about the Mexican border. Hmm. I wasn't. But I know where we go. I married a girl from Biggs. And she married a guy from Gridley. Blech. I married a white girl. She married a Mexican. Do you know what people from other states say when they see our license plates in their state? We hate all you Californians. Get out of here. Every Californian, the only thing they want to do is they want to move out of California and bring California with them. Leave. We don't want you. You don't even know me. And what, what's our thought? We're just going to the border to the east of us. We say we believe in the same flag. We love the same country. But the flag doesn't have the power to unite you. I was having a conversation with somebody about the Christian flag. And he says, well, why don't you fly the Christian flag? And I said, I have an issue. And he said, well, what's the issue? And I said, I, okay, you have one flagpole, and you want to fly the American flag, and you want to fly the Christian flag. Where do you put the Christian flag? He says, below it, because you cannot fly another flag above. And I said, so you're making the statement that you are more American than you are Christian. He says, no, I'm not. I said, okay. That's what that would show. He says, well, what if you put two equal flags and fly them at the same level? And I said, okay, now you're putting that they are the same. Do you agree with that? He said, no. I said, okay. I will fly the American flag. The Bible doesn't tell me I have to fly the Christian flag. I'm not going to. I have an issue with the flag. It doesn't unite us. It should but I've only been alive 40 years, and I've never seen so much separation in my life. We think that the devil is out there attacking the world. He's already got the world. He's attacking the churches. Galatians, please. Galatians 1, 6. I am shocked that you are turning away soon, so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. But is not the good news is but is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again, 
What we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. I think you all need to read that and study it and know it. The Bible has no borders. The Bible has the ability to reach people everywhere. God is outside of time. So not only everywhere and anywhere, but at any time. When we look at the prophecies of the Old Testament, he saw it happen in the future and gave the words to the prophets to write down. So he lives outside of time. And he can do everything. We cannot limit God. I witnessed a very interesting, I'll say funny, thing. I met an Australian man on Friday at a gas station. And he was heading up an outreach program in the city of Orville for a revival. He told me he was associated with Bethel Church. And I said, well, I completely disagree with all of their theology. I actually preach against it all the time. Uh, I don't like Bill Johnson, but I support your ministry if you're doing it for God and not for man and, in, and if not for a church. Because he was out feeding the homeless. I gave him the words that I felt compelled to tell him a theology against Bethel Church, but a theology uh, or a message of God of making sure that what you're doing, you're doing for God and not for man, not to glorify a church. Then he later texted me the name of his outreach. Remember, he's Australian. And his partner was from Austria. Okay? And their, their outreach program is called One Hope for America. Now, we're talking about borders, and the American border is huge. You have North America and you have South America, and everything inside of those borders could be an American ministry, an American outreach. Well, these two people definitely don't live within those borders. I said, okay, this is very interesting. I texted him again this morning, no response, but I texted him Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I just hope. Anyway, Ephesians 2. You know, this man obviously has a heart to serve God. Just following bad leadership. So, Ephesians 2. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way. Following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins... He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. 
For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us. As shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us a new in Christ Jesus. So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. Who were proud of their circumcision even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. We're going to pause after, don't switch after this one. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. This is a constant problem, not just for today, but for a long time ago too. For 2,000 years ago, we've been building separation with people who God calls his own. And for what? Because you play for Gridley Little League? Because you went to Biggs High School? Or Live Oak? Because you grew up in East Biggs, not in West Biggs. Borders are that small. They don't even exist. All right, next slide. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Pause. When you guys imagine being in heaven, I know that's something really hard to imagine. But if in your mind you can somehow convince yourself that there will be Democrats and Republicans in heaven, are they going to be separated by a border? Like, well, the Republicans, oh, you made it to heaven, you go over there. Democrat, you go that way. Or, Palestinians, 
Yeah, yeah, we can't mix you up with the Israelites. You you got to go over there. Oh, you're an actual, you know, from this denomination. You're going to have to be separated from them because you guys have a different theology. We can read this one again. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. So wait a minute. When we go to heaven, we're just going to be family? Hmm. We're not going to be statesmen or countrymen or we're just going to be family? So, if that's true, then I'm on earth with people that I'm family with, or going to be. But wait, it says, all of God's children. Next slide. Together we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his Spirit. Did God get it wrong? When we think of ourselves as Christians, we follow Christ. When we call Christ the cornerstone, well, you better know what that means. That Christ is the cornerstone of God's temple that we are all built around. And you might have a stone of somebody from Orville sitting on top of you as your temple's being built. You might have somebody from San Francisco right next to you. Are you kidding me? You come from a sinful place. Well, guess what? So do you. It's called gridly, full of sin. It's disgusting. The things that God writes to us, that God has done for us, that Christ did for us, that the Holy Spirit continues to try to do for us, and he does it for you. Because we need him. There's this thing that people, if you breathe, you like to do. It's called sin. It's not like we like to do it. We just end up doing it. And when we sin, we feel that separation from God. And so we feel unclean. Or when we were living in sin, we knew that we were too dirty to come to God. We like to think we are so smart. And when we do that, we run away from God. We aren't clean enough for God. Oh, we sinned. Well, welcome to the sinner's party. It's where we're at. We are here because we all need forgiveness. We all need God's grace.
when you run away from God, this, this hit me yesterday at the softball field, okay? You're running away from a person with the ball in their hand, right? But you are also running to something, right? You can't just be running away from something. You're running somewhere, So we had a runner running from going to third. Then third base got the ball, so then she was running to second. So even though you're running away from something, you're running somewhere. And if you are running away from God because you're covered in sin, you're so dirty, and you're running away from God... You're running to something. You can't be running away and not be running somewhere. So if you're running away from what is good, well, then you're running to what is bad. And if you're running away from God, well, you're running right into the arms of the devil. And if you're running away from heaven then you are making a choice to run straight to hell. There, I said it. (gasps) Remember, hell is not a bad word. It's a destination for some people. We are here to make sure that's not our destination, to make sure that it's not their destination. The Bible is there to protect you. There's a lot of information in that Bible. And it does you no good if you don't go find it. If you don't go read it and study it and know it. So that when you see something and you're like, that's not right. How would you know you've never read the Bible? Well, I'm going to go ask Ruth Ann. She knows the Bible. She's read it so many times. I'm going to go talk to Gary. He's read the Bible so many times. He leads a Bible study. He's got to know the Bible. The Holy Spirit will open your eyes, open your heart, open your mind, and let you receive. It'll interpret for you. It'll help you say the names. We serve a great God. He can do a lot of things. We need to practice our obedience. We need to pray more. Read more. Love Understand grace, understand God's family, understand Christ as the cornerstone, and understand that there is a lot of people out there wanting you to mess up. And Balak, he offered Balaam everything, offered him gold and silver if he would just curse God's people because they were too close to his border. Careful who you curse. Father God Almighty, Lord, I give thanks and praise, Lord, for this day, for this beautiful day of the sun shining, the flowers in bloom. We can see your glory, Lord. I lift up Buddy to you as he's working on some farmer's tractor. May he get it going that uh, production can get back tomorrow. Lord, I, uh, I ask for protection over this group, Lord, that you would protect them from anything that would come against them and that they would know that nothing can separate them from you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to uh, 
I practice my obedience to love you. Lord, protect us and guide us as we walk out those doors. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.